And it makes it so much more important to understand what we're talking about here this morning. In the letter to the church at Colossae, we want to look at chapter 1 again this morning. Paul's writing to a little church. It's a little letter to a little church in a little town. But they got some big problems. They're being faced with all kinds of corrupt teaching, false teaching, philosophies that are being introduced to them, things that are above and beyond that which Scripture speaks of as being necessary. And the importance of having that solid foundation, that firm foundation in Jesus Christ because of all of the things that come our way in this world, Rhonda's brother, Billy, Scott and others, my brother's wife, others, we, we, come to, we come to terms with these issues that we face in life, these struggles, and whether we rise above them, whether we are victorious over them, whether we can go to bed at night and sleep depends on that foundation, the firm foundation, that which we believe in the core of our very being. Is there a God in heaven? And if there is a God in heaven, does this God in heaven care for you? And if this God in heaven who cares for you really cares for you, number one, how does he manifest himself to you? How do we recognize God in our life? And how can we survive these, these casualties how do we understand the pain and the suffering in our life? Lenny was sharing something with me with us yesterday. We were talking and, uh, about a person who was addressing his teacher, his professor. And uh, I don't remember all of the details, but it's awesome. We'll bring it next week. But one of the, one of the things that the professor was saying, somebody had said something about uh, the reality of God, and the professor denied the reality of God. If God is so good, then why does evil happen in the world today? And if God created evil, then that means that God himself is evil. And uh, therefore, you know, there's no God. So the student asks the question about evil. And he asks him, what is evil? And he said, you know, there's no such thing as evil. Okay, think about that for a moment. There's no such thing as evil. And he asked the professor, and there is no darkness either. And the professor said, what do you mean there's no darkness either? He said, there's no evil, there's no darkness. He said, you know that uh, in science, if true science studies things, right? You can catalog it, you can dialogue it, you can, you, know, you can measure it, you can do all kinds of things with stuff, right? He said, we can do that with light. Did you know we can study light? We can study the effects of, we can study light itself. But he said, you know what, there's no such thing as darkness because we can't study darkness. You can't measure darkness. There's nothing about darkness that you can tangibly do scientifically, he said the Word of God says that darkness is really just the absence of light, and evil is really just the absence of goodness. God is present in the world today, and we can see him, we can experience him. This little church at Colossae were struggling with, with these things in their lives that were drawing them away from the light. That, were, that was drawing them into darkness. Spiritism, Eastern mysticisms, philosophies, Judaistic rules and laws and, and rituals and that sort of thing. And he's laying down the foundation for them. He's telling them concerning Jesus Christ that Christ is the only foundation for truth. He is the truth. Jesus is all you need. Jesus Christ alone is all we need for the world today and the problems that we face. He writes, uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 18, 
Concerning Jesus, he says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That Jesus, who has always been, who always will be, is the creator of all things. He is the one with whom we have to deal with. He is the one who gives life, who takes life. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he must be first and foremost in your hearts and in your minds. Father, again, open our our hearts and our minds to your word, that we would grasp the fundamental truth of who Jesus is. Amen. You know, it was John the Baptist. When we talk about Jesus Christ and the importance that he has in our life, you can be religious all day long and not have peace with God. You can quote scripture and not be saved. You can be in church every day of the week and it won't do one thing for you. You can be just as pious, just as spiritual. You can, you can grasp all the religions like so many do, uh, of all the religions of the world, and you can embrace everybody. We can have this coexist mentality, but yet be just as far from God as the pagan, atheistic person who rejects God. Jesus is the only one. So John the Baptist, John the Baptist is on the scene. And this is what he said about Jesus. Uh, John chapter 1, starting in verse 29. Let me just read this to you. This is what John the Baptist said about Christ. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him. John is baptizing out there into Jordan. He sees Jesus coming coming unto him, and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Literally, can you imagine John the Baptist out there in the wilderness, and all of a sudden he sees Jesus coming. He hadn't met him before. Here he comes. And literally what, it, literally what this verse says is Jesus says, Hey, everybody! <laughs> Look over here. This is Jesus. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one that's going to take away our sin. This is the one that I spoke about. This is He who takes away the sin of the world. He existed before me. For He is the first in time. He is the first in in existence, he is the first in authority and in power, is what John is saying. He is the first. He was before me. Well, maybe he was like the Yanomami. You know, the Yanomami Indians that we lived with and Lenny grew up with all those many years, they don't count. They have no reckoning of days and weeks and months, and therefore they don't know what a birthday is. They don't celebrate years. They don't count birthdays. They don't know how to count. And oftentimes we have seen uh, a child born, two years later another child born, and then when they're about 10 or 12, you know what they say? The youngest one's older than the oldest one. Because he just grew bigger and stronger and healthier. Who was born before John the Baptist? Was Jesus born before John the Baptist? John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus was born. So how is it that John the Baptist is out there saying, hey, this is Jesus. He came before I did. He didn't say he was born before I did. He existed before I did. And he outranks me. <laughs> Not only does he outrank John, he outranks all of us. Later on, uh, Jesus and his disciples are out. Uh, John the Baptist and his disciples are out baptizing. 
in Jordan, and uh, along comes Jesus. You can turn over to John 3 if you want. And uh, so Jesus is baptizing in his disciples, though Jesus himself wasn't actually doing the baptizing, but John uh, was baptizing with his disciples. Jesus' disciples are baptizing. They're out there in the Jordan area, and uh, John's disciples get into a discussion with some of the Pharisees and some of the other guys, and the, the conver in the conversation it comes up that, hey, you know what, this Jesus fella, his disciples, they're baptizing a whole lot more guys than you are. They're baptizing more people than, than you are. So they, the disciples, verse 26, uh, they say unto John, hey, they're baptizing more men than we are, and all the people are going to him. You think they might be a little jealous? Maybe a little protective of their little turf? Since Jesus showed up, their crowds were getting smaller. Since Jesus came on the scene, he's not getting the popularity vote. Since Jesus came along, his disciples are kind of getting, running out of a job. Hey, this Jesus and his disciples, they're baptizing more than we are, and all the people are going over there. I want you to notice what John's attitude was in the whole situation. What was it that John uh, said? What is, what is his attitude in all of this? This is what he said. Verse 28, you yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the Christ. I'm just the messenger boy. <laughs> I told you I wasn't him. I'm just the messenger. Jesus is the bridegroom. And those that are with him are his bride. And John, being the Jewish prophet, Jesus, the bridegroom, his disciples that are being saved under Jesus are the bride of Christ. That's you and me. John is representative of Israel. Israel is the wife of Jehovah. Israel is the friend of the bridegroom's bride. So we see the church and the bridegroom. John went on and he said this, I'm content. <laughs> I am completely satisfied. My joy is full. He is here. And he is starting that new work that he said he was going to do. He's going to build his church, the bride, the bride of Christ. And there's going to be a wedding someday. Revelation speaks about that future day when we will be married to Christ in heaven. And then that supper where the bride and the bridegroom uh, come together and the friends of the bride, which is Israel, will be there as well. And then the millennial kingdom. But that's for another, that's for another Sunday. But the bridegroom's coming and he might come today. We don't know when he's coming back for his bride, John 14, 1, but we do know he is coming. And we have to be ready. We have to be prepared for that. And John said, hey, you know what? I'm totally content. I'm at peace with this. My joy is complete. My joy is full. And then notice what he says in verse 30. <laughs> he must increase and I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. But he that cometh from heaven is above all. He, Jesus, came down from heaven. He had inhabited heaven uh, from eternity past. He has always been, and he always will be. And he came down from heaven. John the Baptist is of the earth. Jesus is of heaven. And he, Jesus, outranks, literally, all of us. He is better. He's better than everything. Did you know that Jesus is better than Abraham? Did you know that Jesus Christ is better than Moses and the law of Moses? Jesus is better than the angels. And these are the three areas that, 
they deal with, or Paul deals with in this letter to the Colossians. Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Abraham. And you know how many people base their religion on Abraham? He's better than Abraham. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. You think you got to keep the law? The law can't do anything for you. But Jesus can. Did you know that Jesus is better than deer season? <laughs> I, I see that head shaking no over there. That's a tough one for me too. That he might have the preeminence because he is better. He's better than the doctors. He's better than anything that we can even imagine. He outranks everybody. There's nobody better than he is. And he has no equal. Jesus is not just another manifestation of God like so many uh, would have us believe, like so many teach. He is not Muhammad. He is not Allah. He is not Buddha. He is not Oprah. He is not anything that we could compare him to. He is above and beyond all of that. He is the preeminent one. John said, I must decrease. He must increase. You know, a lot of times that's our problem because we get in the way. John didn't want to get in the way. John was not standing in the way of Jesus Christ's ministry. In fact, he graciously bowed out of that ministry. He got arrested and sent to jail, got his head cut off. <laughs> I don't know if I want to step out of the way that way. But in another sense, we do, because that's what it requires. Death to self. And that's when it gets tough. Am I better than Jesus Christ? No, I'm not better than Jesus do I know more than Jesus? Sometimes I think so. Sometimes we act like we know more than he does. Sometimes we act as though we know more, we know better than he does. Because we ignore him, or we don't go and ask him, we don't stop and consider what would Jesus do, but rather we just rip on on with life, irregardless of who Christ is. And who is Christ? the creator of all things. We're too often, we often let others interfere with what God wanted for us. Oftentimes we let the old man, our old nature, our old sin, sinful nature get in the way. And we, Paul encourages us, we have to die daily to ourselves. We have to decrease. We have to allow him to increase, to have the preeminence more and more and more in our hearts and in our lives. In Isaiah 45, chapter 45, verses 22 and 23, God says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all of the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, in righteousness, and it shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall swear, that is literally swear allegiance, or confess that he is Lord. That's God speaking. That's Jehovah speaking to Israel, to the world, back in the prophet's day of Isaiah. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says that Jesus gave up his throne in heaven for us. That he set aside his, his godhood. He gave up his throne. He gave up his riches in heaven. And he became a man, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He came and died for us, therefore making peace between God and us so that we can have the peace of God in our hearts. So when these things assail us, when these things happen, when problems arise, guess what? There is a peace available to the child of God. No matter how dark, no matter how uh, horrible our life seems to be or how difficult things get, we can still experience peace. We can have that peace from God if we acknowledge Him as Lord. He went on in verses 9 and 11 in Philippians 
Therefore God hath highly exalted him, Jesus, giving him a name which is above every name. He's not an it. He's not a force. He's not just some ecumenical power that we can harness and get through life with. He has a name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of the things in heaven and the things in earth and the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess to God that Jesus is Christ, the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And this is what Paul is telling this little church in Colossae. That's what they have to do. Yeah, you're faced with a lot. We are faced with a lot. We endure a lot. We go through a lot. You're going to be faced with all kinds of stuff. But what's the key? The foundational truth. Christ is Lord. He is he is God. He gave up everything. He came into this world. That through the blood of Jesus, we have peace, we have the forgiveness of sins, and we can be saved. We have a bright future. We have an eternal life. Jesus has redeemed us. This, who is the preeminent one, redeemed you, bought you with his own precious blood. And you know what that means? If you've been bought, what does that mean? You belong to him, to him who bought you. And if you were bought, it means that you were sold. <laughs> who sold you out? How did God create man in the first place? Perfect, right? And in a perfect relationship and in a perfect world. And the devil came along and Adam sold us out. I would say Eve, but we're outnumbered, guys. God's word said it was Adam who was in the transgression and not the woman. Eve was deceived, but man willfully disobeyed God. And because of that, we were sold out to Satan. We became slaves to the devil and to sin and to destruction. But Jesus, God, came to this earth and he bought us back. That's what it means to be redeemed. Twice purchased. <laughs> I remember the story of a little boy who made a sailboat. This little boy worked hard and he crafted a little sailboat and he loved it. He was proud of it. He did an awesome job and he made it according to his own. He designed the thing. He built the thing. And he'd take it down to the little creek and he'd sail it and he was so proud of his little sailboat that he made, that he created. Well, one day it got away from him. And down the creek it went. Boy, he chased after that thing. And the faster he ran, the faster it sailed. And the wind caught it and carried it out from the creek into the river. And down the river it went. He was so sad. His little sailboat that he designed, that he built, that he created was lost. And then one day, he was in the city with his folks. And they were walking down Main Street. And in the 5 and 10 he saw his little sailboat for sale. He looked at that. He looked at that. That's my sailboat. I created that design. I built that thing. I sailed that thing. That's my boat. And he went running in there all excited. Mr. Store owner, he said, that's my boat. I want it back. You know what the guy said? He said, I, I found it. It's mine. If you want it, you got to buy it back. You know what the devil told God? You want this man? You're going to buy him back. He's mine. And Jesus paid for your redemption through his precious blood. And he bought us back. Jesus, God incarnate, saved us. 1 Corinthians 16 tells us, Therefore we are not our own, for we are bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. Did you know that? He bought us. Colossians 1, 15 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The word that's translated image from the Greek expresses two different thoughts. Man, we're just getting warmed up, so... That clock's about 10 minutes fast, by the way. Did you guys know that? 
So he said, why do you preach over all the time? I said, because the clock's fast. <laughs> we could hang on this verse for a long time. Two different concepts for the word image. The word image expresses likeness. And it also expresses a manifestation. The invisible that is made visible. God is invisible. And the invisible God, through Jesus Christ, has, made, has been made visible to us. Have you ever seen God? We see Jesus. It was Philip who said, Jesus, show us the Father and that'll be enough. And what did Jesus tell him? Philip, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. The word likeness, that's, that denotes this reflection of something. And there's a big, Im, big difference between an image by imitation and an image by derivation. Some of you folks have been here for a while. Remember that sermon from me and... Uh, uh, Major Ian Thomas on what image is. An image of derivation. Whew. Man, we could really get going. Jesus Christ is the derived image of God himself. What's the difference between an image by imitation and an image by derivation? A derived image? Go to Facebook. Look up my wife and you'll see all kinds of images of me. You might think she likes me. I can't stand Facebook. But you know what you're seeing there when you look at my pictures on that Facebook page? You're not seeing me. You're just seeing a copy of me. You're just seeing an imitation of me. You're just seeing a portrait of me. Isn't that great? Yeah. Amen? It's, it's getting late. Come on. The difference is, it's just a copy. Jesus is not just a manifestation or a copy of who God is like. The likeness, the image of Jesus Christ is a derived image. A derived image is what you get when you look in the mirror, other than maybe a heart attack, depending on what time of day you're looking at yourself. You go to the mirror, what you see is what you is, right? Right? That's why my wife's, oh, never mind. I'm not even, nope, not even going to go there. I was going to say, that's why your drawer's full of makeup. But What you see in that image in the mirror is you. That's your image, unless the mirror's distorted like the circus. You know, you got these wavy ones and funny ones that make you look tall, short. No, the image that you see in the mirror is a derived image. You're the origin of that image. And if you don't believe me, go home, look in the mirror, look at yourself, and then duck out of the mirror, and then peek back in and see if you're still there. <laughs> you are the origin of the image. But not only are you the origin of that image in the mirror, you are the source and the sustainer of it. That image in the mirror is only you as long as you are in the mirror. Jesus Christ is the direct image of God. He is the origin of that image himself. He is the source of that image. He is the sustainer of that image. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 declares the same thing. Jesus who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, his deity, his godhood, his very eternal being and nature is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The Shekinah glory of the Old Testament is Christ. And that is the foundational truth. And I got about 14 more pages, but we'll wait till next week. <laughs> I heard that. Amen. <laughs> How important is it that we understand Jesus? How important is it that we have this fundamental truth grounded in our hearts and minds so that when things happen, 
we can find peace. We can find hope. And we can trust Him, Jesus Christ, no matter what comes or whatever offers itself as a cheap substitute. We will know the truth. And the truth will make us free. Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming into this world and revealing to us who you really are. Thank you for God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And Lord, today as we reflect on this letter to the church at Colossae, we too realize how important it is for us to understand these fundamental truths of your deity, of who you are. Because we... Lord, are bombarded with so many things all the time that want our time and want to displace you from being God. There are many who don't believe at all in God, much less in you, Lord Jesus. So we pray that we would be faithful to you, that we would allow you to be God in us. And Father, we do pray once again that you would build us up and establish us in the faith that like these believers there so many years ago in Colossae would be encouraged knowing that you and you alone are Christ and it's in Christ's name that we pray